How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 26th video on the channel, and today we're going to be looking at the 12th and 13th chapters of Louis Yamsu's book Prolegomena to a Theory of Language. Last time, we took a look into Yamsu's complex system of definitions, examining the different types of dependences and the division between functives and functions. I'm quite excited for today's episode, because it's here that we'll actually be getting into his semiotics although there are still plenty of definitions to work through. There are only two chapters we'll be going over today in this episode. Firstly, signs and figure A, and then expression and content. He begins this first chapter by outlining a peculiarity that appears concerning the entities found through deduction. In the case of certain entities, like the exclamation A ah in English, small units count as sentences, clauses, and words, all at the same time. In order to account for these cases, Yamsu says that we have to introduce what he calls a special rule of transference. This rule serves to prevent a given entity from being further analyzed at a too early stage of the procedure. To do this, it allows certain entities, under very specific circumstances, to pass from stage to stage of analysis unanalyzed. However, he puts this to the side for a moment in order to underline the importance of producing exhaustive inventories for linguistics. These inventories may contain all entities with the same kind of dependence. In other words, those which can occupy the same position in a spoken or written chain. Take this table as an example of such an inventory, composed of the words dog, cat, duck, and horse. Each of these words has the same relationship with the words around them. They all act as subjects that can enter the written chain in the same way. Moving onwards, Yamsu states, When we compare the inventories yielded at the various stages of the deduction, their size will usually turn out to decrease as the procedure goes on. This is true even if the text being examined is unrestricted. That's to say, if it's continually being added to. At this point, it's important to note that text in Yamsu doesn't necessarily correspond to a written document. Instead, as a term, it refers to any process connected to language as a system, including the spoken word and living languages as a whole. Returning back to the book itself, there's always a point in deduction where the inventory becomes limited in size. For example, even if parts are continually being added on, languages can only have so many possible combinations of vowels and consonants, despite the fact that their number might be rather high. It's because of this characteristic that linguistics goal of an exhaustive, simple description is possible in the first place. In his words, If no restricted inventory appeared however long the analysis were continued, an exhaustive description would be impossible. When it comes to simplicity, he says that the smaller the final inventory is, the more it agrees with the empirical principle we discussed in the previous two episodes. At this point, we have made two major observations. Firstly, an entity, like the exclamation A, ah, can act in multiple roles at the same time. And secondly, the size of inventories decreases through the analytic procedure, moving from unrestricted to restricted. These two features are viewed by Yamslu to be fundamental to the notion of language as being a system of signs. As he states, that a language is a system of signs seems a priori an evident and fundamental proposition, which linguistics will have to take into account at an early stage. To explain what he means, Yamsu offers a very rudimentary definition of signs, or rather, sign expressions as he calls them. Essentially, signs are anything that communicates meaning separate from the sign itself. Just take the example of the word tree a favorite among structuralists. It's a sign because the word communicates something without actually being the object that's communicated. In other words, signs are bearers of meaning. His goal with the rest of this chapter is basically to decide to what degree language can be called a system of signs. To begin with, entities like sentences, clauses, and words all appear to bear meaning, and thus are signs. However, Yamsu wants to go deeper to carry out his analysis as far as possible. As he says, many words aren't indivisible. They can further be broken down into other signs, like suffixes, roots, and what have you. His example is the word inactivates, 
composed of five parts. The prefix in, meaning not, act, a root, if, an adjectival suffix, eight, turning it into a verb, and s, a third person conjugation. Thus, it's not just one sign, but five, all its components themselves containing meaning. Yet this meaning that they bear only exists in a specific context. For instance, the prefix in means nothing by itself. It gains its value only as it relates to other signs, like activate. However, this doesn't really differentiate them from whole words, since, as stated by Yamslu, any entity, and thus also any sign, is defined relatively, not absolutely, and only by its place in the context. For instance, the word 10 only means something in relation to other words like 9 and 11. There's no such thing as meaning in a vacuum. It's for this reason that he says we can't classify some units as more significant than others. At the end of the day, they're all contextual. Moving on now, Analyzing further shows us that there's a point where signs cannot be decomposed into meaningful units. Eventually, sign expressions can only be broken down into phonemes, syllables, and so on. These non-signifying pieces are what he terms figure A, the units that make up signs without bearing any meaning in themselves. It's thus that language isn't purely a sign system. It's always underlined by a complex web of figure A that produce signs in the first place. With this, we get to chapter 13, titled Expression and Content. Here, this focuses on choosing between two contradicting positions of the nature of signs. The first, the traditional view, being that they are first and foremost signs for something. In other words, that they are expressions that point to content outside of a sign itself. Whilst the second, developed by Ferdinand de Saussure, being that signs are produced through a connection between content and expression. To find the appropriate position, Yamsu says that we have to stop talking about signs as such, but rather as sign functions, contracted by functives of expression and content. This function is a solidarity, meaning that both functives are interdependent. In other words, expression can't exist without content, and content can't exist without expression. To borrow his words, an expression is expression only by virtue of being an expression of a content, and a content is content only by virtue of being a content of an expression. He now moves on to what he terms purport, the amorphous unformed mass that all language has in common. As can be seen in this diagram, he offers a list of chains to explain what he means. Despite their differences, these phrases all have a shared factor, the thought that underlies them. However, this thought mass, purport, is cut up or rather formed differently from language to language. Take for instance Danish, which includes an object, det meaning it, where French and English don't. Purport thus acts as a substance in which form is revealed or made perceptible, divided by sign functions. As Yamsu says, we thus recognize in the linguistic content, in its process, a specific form, the content form, which is independent of and stands in arbitrary relation to the purport, and forms it into a content substance. To demonstrate this, take colors as an example, where the whole spectrum represents purport. Content form is what divides up that spectrum, attaching different meanings to the same area and leaving asymmetries between the content substances of different languages. He represents this with a diagram. Here, we can see how Welsh and English divide up colours. In the prior, the word glass carries connotations of blue, grey and green in the latter. It's the same region of purport, the colour spectrum, but with different meanings, or more accurately, different content substances resulting. The same thing, Yamsu says, can be observed in expression. For instance, we can talk of an expression purport, which is made up of all possible sounds humans can make, or even the different parts of the mouth responsible for producing them. This purport is then cut up differently in each language through expression form, leaving the different sounds that make up the spoken word as expression substance. 
Turning back to the sign itself, he says that expression form and content form can now be formally defined as the two functives that contract it, and that it is only between the relationship of these two functives that content substance and expression substance can exist. This leads him to his famous phrase. Substance appears by the forms being projected onto the purport, just as an open net casts its shadow down on an undivided surface. With this, we can return to our original question of which approach to science, be it traditional or Sasurian, is correct. In Yamsu's eyes, it's true that a sign is a sign for something, that something existing outside the sign function, like the tree in our example earlier. However, he also says that those trees, the ones in the world, not the word itself, are entities that fall under content substance, organized by the content form of the sign function. In this way, we can pass the phrase a sign is a sign for something to mean that the content form of a sign can subsume that something as content substance. When it comes to expression, much of the same occurs. The word tree, as a unique combination of sounds, is an entity of expression substance. And, in his words, By virtue of the sign, and only by virtue thereof, it is ordered to an expression form and classified under it with various other entities of expression substance. It's thus that a sign is double-sided. It's impossible to separate content and expression. Moving along, Yamsu now says that the distinction between the two and their interaction in the sign function is fundamental to the structure of any language. To quote yet again, Any sign, any system of signs, any system of figure ordered to the purpose of signs, any language contains in itself an expression form and a content form. Because of this fact, every analysis must be carried out on two lines, one for expression and one for content. Ending the chapter, he says that the names of these two terms are completely arbitrary in nature and could, if someone really wanted to for whatever reason, be flipped. The only thing that's important to the planes of content and expression is their definition as mutually interdependent. Now, this concludes chapters 12 and 13 from Louis Yamsu's book Prolegomena to a Theory of Language. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. Until then, bye!